Hello, everyone. Welcome to First Down Financial. My name is Steve Vetteral and our retirement safe growth seminar. We're going to try and begin here soon, if I may, please. I want to double check that everybody can hear me okay. I do have the chat window open. So if you guys have any questions on anything, if it's a lot of times if you can't hear or sound, you can always log out and log back into Zoom. Oftentimes that'll fix the problem. Uh, but if somebody wants to post something in the chat window here, I got, got all my screens open up, ready to go. Got a lot of people attending today. So we can see uh, having a whole bunch of people still filtering into the webinar. For those that just joined us, my name is Steve Vetteran, one of the managing partners here at First Down Financial. Um, and along with my partner, Steve Ruff, we essentially run the organization. Um, I see, looks like somebody's having connection issues. If you want, just log out um, and then log back in. And uh, that should help. Let me just take a look at the chat here, see where we are. <clears throat> chat says it's disabled. So, hmm. Actually, you know what? So just go ahead and type your questions in the Q&A window. That way I don't have to fumble around, turn on the chat. So if you got any questions in there, if you guys aren't hearing me okay, uh, that's fine. But again, we have had, <laughs> to say the least, just a tremendous amount of interest in uh, what First Down's doing. I think that um, the problem with a lot of corporate America and certainly government um, is that many employees have, you know, I think they get educated quite well internally from those organizations, but the, the concept of risk or how to allocate or making changes in the marketplace, um, certainly with the really risky environment we have in front of us is just, it's not communicated adequately to employees. And since both Steve and I come from an award-winning educational-based background in finance, especially with the company we run here in Orlando, uh, we thought it was really important to try and make some inroads into a number of organizations within the government. So um, our office is here headquartered in Orlando. This is our second event with the USDA. And what we're really trying to do is just lay out a structure to help everybody successfully get educated in the fields of retirement planning. And most importantly, our concern with the current market environment and what we're doing right now to position clients to avoid big downside risk. And quite now, in my opinion, and with a lot of my podcasts and the book that Steve and I just had coming out, we'll show that to you guys. You'll have access to the book. Um, it is of paramount importance right now because going forward, based upon the fact that very simply without getting too deep into it, interest rates are going up, cost of capital is going up, and that can put a real strain on the importance of a, an economy, not only from an earnings perspective, but also from the structure of employment, which is high. So it's a strange impasse that we're sort of at at this point. And a lot of people are really concerned about what's going on in the marketplace. So even though I know you guys have been educated, I'm going to present it from a different perspective. One thing I would absolutely love I'll just have my email and everything on the last slide is if you guys want to see anything outside of what I'm talking about, send me an email. We're always open to feedback. Quite frankly, a lot of the way we're going to be structuring in this is to have probably different types of educational modules. Um, this doesn't have to be a difficult thing. You'll see today, I'll actually refer to a couple of pages in our book. Book's a very short book, but it really does address the issues of risk in portfolio management, how it should be actively managed going forward. So let's uh, go ahead and share my screen here. I just want to go through a couple of PowerPoint slides. I always think it's important that, you know, if somebody is out there in financial land and you guys probably see way too much of this on TV, um, squawking about this and that, is that the track record of any individual should be demonstrated um, and publicly accessible. So as I often will say to students, clients, we have a whole mess of advisors that partner with us out in the marketplace, uh, trying to all take care of clients the correct way. Um, but everything that we talk about, and I will hear, is also on my podcast, um, which I'll show you in the link to. So let me just go ahead and share a screen. And I'll start off with a couple of slides. So again, for those just joining us, welcome. Um, 
the and, and you know honestly <laughs> I, the question i just got i i have to probably apologize for how we worded the seminar um you will get hopefully a lot of great information out this regardless of what your age is right i mean outside of any advice the most important thing if you have room in the budget um, is quite frankly to max out right retirement plans in the workplace in this case it's the TSP, right? Max it out if you can. If it's not in the budget, maybe you can adjust the budget to max it out down the road, right? So outside of that, in contributing to a Roth IRA, and I'm actually going to show you guys some of the contribution limits for here in the next slide or so. Um, but those are the most important things you can do to build wealth, um, at least from a employment standpoint in the TSP or any federal or corporate type employee. But Really, the most important thing, in our opinion, is to understand that beyond maxing out contribution limits, um, the second most important thing, which may even take precedence in the current market, um, is that you really recognize the risk that's associated with each of your investments that you're in. So let's go to page two here. So uh, just a real quick about us, I think, again, important to understand who we are. Um, I will, if I forget... Um, let me just say this up front. I think the, the industry as a whole spends an inordinate amount of time with clients on asset allocation. And don't get me wrong, it's exceptionally important in a portfolio management, but the, the dynamicness, make up my own word as I often do, the dynamics surrounding the changes to that portfolio from a risk perspective is the single most important thing you could do. The problem is, is if you're not, you know, you don't have the time to manage it, which is understandable, um, or the seeking out the right professional help, um, a, a solid group of advisors can bring significantly higher returns just from an investment standpoint over your whole career. So, but you can see here, we're a nationwide firm. We offer everything essentially under the sun other than hedge funds. Uh, we custody at Schwab, Steve and I, I've been in the business for a long period of time. We are registered with both FINRA, SEC, as well as Florida. Um, this is maybe not something you're too used to seeing, but we are a DFA, Catalyst Approved Advisor. This is really rare uh, because these are two advisor-only purchased companies. Um, we have to go through significant training, university-based stuff in order to get approved, which we were five years ago. Uh, but my partner, Stephen Ruff, it's been in the insurance industry running Elite Well Strategy since 1984. So he is one of our thought leaders that brings a deep bench of expertise in multiple investment strategies, including tax-free growth and, and what's most important right now, uh, protecting wealth. Um, I will also, and I think we have it in the workflows to automatically send it out to you guys, our previous webinar. But one thing I love and I always hear from clients about Steve is that He's seen almost everything under the sun in terms of client cases, and he can recite verbatim some of the most successful uh, that he has instituted for clients. So it's almost like a case study chat or a fireside chat, if you will, on the subject. And I, I think it's really good. So myself, been in the industry, uh, working since 1998, uh, mostly chief market analyst right now for Avoria Prime, as well as co-managing partner here at First Down. So we are a fee-only registered investment advisor. Um, I am a Series 65. Have done a lot of different things over the last 20 years. Some of the things I'm most proud of are my 2017 Investopedia Top 100 Advisors Award. Um, I am a Xavier grad uh, with a degree in finance. I am in the industry, exact same thing. I graduated from college. I know that's a rare thing these days. Um, live in Florida with my two younger children. Um, but the firm as a whole, um, it's there's about 12 of us that run the organization down here. So we've got about 600 clients, um, and we serve as clients nationwide. We're registered in all states. Um, as far as the agenda today, which is most important, we want to show ways to indemnify either your TSP or your investment accounts and IRAs. So there has to be a prudent path to make sure that the money grows. Obviously, it has low risk, um, but that you never run out of money for the rest of your lives. And I know this seems like 
a goal that's that's it almost seems like fairy dust or it's just something that's in the clouds but it absolutely does happen for clients at first down every day because as you see in the second bullet point right here mitigating your portfolio against market risk while achieving diversification and more importantly growth is the first and second most or i should say the the, the first and second most important thing in your portfolio so just as a I don't really we can have I literally have like 15 slides to go through the stats of all this but just to understand this it is of probably you know third most important if we're sort of assigning bullet points to this is that you know starting to save for retirement started at an early age and look I get it with costs and inflation all these days not everybody's got this in the budget uh, but what I'll always tell people is that the earlier you start and there's mass loads of research on this, the better shot you have at having bigger accounts down the road, right? So as you may not have seen, somebody that starts an account of 50, um, you really got to put a ton of money away to get into some of the bigger numbers that I'll show you in some of these examples. Uh, but the bottom line really is, is that we're living a lot longer. Um, and I, I don't think it's outside of the realm to plan for a 20 to 40 year retirement. So critical, not only that, you know, one lives within their means or the family, uh, but that you structure investments and income coming off them to be set in such a way that you will never run out of money for the rest of your life, right? It's not a difficult thing to do. We will hopefully illustrate all of this to you throughout the course of this and our successive webinars that we're presenting. So I'm going to jump over real quick to um, our book. And we'll kind of deep dive into this. This is the book that just came out. Uh, we have this both in print and PDF format. I can get it to you guys if you want me to send out a PDF, which we may just automatically do in our workflows here. Uh, but I will make reference to this throughout this discussion here today. Uh, but I do think it's pretty important that when you're looking at on page 15 is what's called the four quadrants. And so you can make this in viewable actually I'll get it on so retirement essentially can be visualized as a quadrant right each section pertaining to a particular make sure I got this screen share did everybody see the book screen let me know if you can <clears throat> sometimes um, zoom just has a mind of its own but in any case I, we always like to view retirement as a quadrant you can look at it any way you want but Really, it has sections pertaining to particular puzzle pieces. I find this is the easiest way to explain this, but essentially we have no control over some of the pieces, right? So others can be missing altogether due to poor planning, or maybe you didn't start saving early enough, um, but the robust retirement plans will have all four pieces in place. And this really doesn't have to be a difficult thing. The pieces are social security. You know, I'm not gonna get too into that today. Although, honestly, I could put out an hour discussion on um, retirements in terms of Social Security. The real problem, in our view, is will the fund be around in 30 years, right? That's certainly an arguable point. But outside of Social Security, in quadrant two, you have your pension, your IRA, um, and you know 401k, 403b, which is more public sector stuff. Um, and then you have different types of accounts. It can be brokerage accounts. It can be annuities. You know, you have the different investment accounts that format Q2. This is obviously where asset allocation comes into play, maximizing contributions, all that fun stuff is important. But outside of that, in the next quadrant, you have tax-free retirement. And this is where the benefits, as some of you may know, to what a Roth IRA offers. I'm going to go into some of the contribution limits next. Uh, but there are all kinds of triple tax-free retirement options out there that many Americans do not know of. And, and it's really sad. This is probably the most underserved quadrant of the four, very simply because the average person doesn't know that you can actually put money in a whole life insurance policy, which has much lower fees now. And the entire growth inside that policy, outside of the death benefit that it provides, is completely tax-free of, of any income. And when that is positioned correctly, it can be a massively powerful tool in your retirement, let's just call it arsenal, right? 
and then outside, obviously, all the benefits of annuities. Um, but without, and, and this book goes way into all this stuff, but the Q4 quadrant is what's called living benefits, okay? I'm going to show you that many of how we position clients allow um, a death benefit while having home health care, while having long-term care, and in some cases, a doubler in benefits um, to take care of those, right? Because, I mean, the biggest probably shocker to many looking to put together the four quadrants are that their long-term health care costs are just insane. But there are products investment-wise out there that can give you riders that will take care of long-term care, that will give you doublers for nursing home protection. I'm going to show a slide on that piece as well. But those are the four quadrants. And again, the book really dives into all four in a much deeper. Um, I wanted to just kind of touch on that today, just in the interest of time, so we can give you guys an understanding. You know what I may do now that I think about this is just take a seminar and go through each quadrant, which would be a much deeper dive. And I'll have to <laughs> find a way to simplify it from the 20 pages that it encompasses in each of the book um, sections. But I do want to show this. This is the 23 tax reference guide. Um, neither this nor the book we showed in our first seminar because they weren't out yet. Um, but now we have all the numbers. Just a couple of points I want to note on this. Uh, gifting went up to 17 grand, by the way. And keep in mind that is per individual. So you can gift an unlimited amount to individuals of 17,000. So husband and wife can give 17 and 17 each to a single child going forward. Uh, IRA contribution limits. There's where it's starting to get really good. So you have the under 50 category, 6,500, and then over 50, you know, you get what I call the, the boost. Uh, so it's an extra thousand you can put away, right? But remember, if you're if you're contributing to an IRA, I far, far prefer a Roth because you get no tax deduction going in, right? So you're putting post-tax money inside of it. It is completely tax-free forever. And it never, ever the money has to be drawn out like a regular IRA. So there is a distinct advantage between the two. Yes, there are contribution limits depending on income. So I'm not going to get too much into that, but you can see that. And I guess if you guys want the tax chart, we could certainly send that out to you as well. I'm kind of just... <laughs> um, yeah, the TSP is in Q2, Glenn. Yes, sorry. It, TSP, the Thrift Savings Plan, which I'm going to show the screen on that next as well. Um, you know, essentially is just a 401k for, for lack of, uh, for lack of just simplification, but so 401k contribution limits, these are getting pretty big if you're over 50. And if you are in the, that kind of income, you can put up to 30 G's in it. Um, whether or not you get the match or not just depends upon obviously a public or private sector employees and what the match would be. Um, but on page two, the IRA beneficiary options, which is getting a bit complex at this point, and this is the updated version as of the Secure Act 2.0 that was signed into law by the administration as of December 31st. So what it does is it goes into um, a detail of the beneficiary options, depending on whether your spouse or children or non-children uh, based beneficiaries. So we've got all that covered. You guys got any questions on any of that first found can totally go through some of that with you guys. Um, show me over to the TSP account because this uh, presentation is really about risk. And I want to make sure you guys are clear on what's going on inside the TSP. So I'm looking at TSP.gov. This is actually a really good site. Um, and going through, as I do every year, the performance inside the TSP um, which no surprise to those somewhat plugged into what's going on. I have it highlighted here in 22 was pretty poor. So as many of you may know, the small cap fund, I just look and just think about S small cap stock versus C common stock um, versus F, which is the fixed fund, right? Remember when interest rates are increasing, bond prices are going down. It's a complete inverse correlation or a seesaw, if you will. So if bond prices are um, declining, Yields are going up, which we're currently seeing now, obviously, short-term yields on money markets or any type of short-based instrument, short-term ETFs, anything that's treasury-based, 
you know, they're all paying a lot more. I mean, heck, some of them are paying close to five and a half percent while inflation is still running, you know, arguably depending on the area, the high sevens to low eights, right? So you're still not keeping up with the cost of inflation, which hopefully will come down. Our concern, which is a always seems to be a, a constantly changing view, but our concern of first down, which I've illustrated in many blogs on the website, which I'm going to show you guys here. If you want to find any of this information, just click on the media and awards tab. You can see my ugly face there and some of the different presentations that I've made in our book. Uh, but this is a link to uh, my market watch call. This is the podcast I talked about. Again, this is a great place to do a deeper dive. And as I tell a lot of clients, this is also a really good place to sort of hold our head to the fire, right? Did these guys do what they said? You guys can also go to broker check here and do any kind of research on us as a firm. They could see what we've done historically. This is all the SEC database stuff. Um, the important thing to understand is you're choosing an advisor. This could be a risk thing certainly as well, is that you want to choose an advisor. Obviously, it has experience that can demonstrate they are you know, good at what he or she does. But I think also it's important that you hire, if you want to, an advisor that has no disclosures on their reports, meaning that in my case, it's zero over the last 23 years. So it's like having an 850 credit score in advisor land. And, you know, many of the awards that have been handed out to Steve and I for educational purposes have been because of um, much of what we try to do in education. And, <laughs> you know, we, uh, we're being welcomed into agencies of the government. So it's a big honor for us, you know, we're really happy and really thankful. And, you know, we want to do the right thing. And I have, you know, obviously an open feedback loop uh, that I'm going to have with everybody. We've gotten a couple of events kicked off at the National Institute of Health as well. And they're giving us tons of feedback, but, you know, they, <laughs> they like what we've decided to start with in the risk category. So um, with that being said, um, let me just jump into the next slide because let's talk about some risk. Actually, you know what? Go to the next slide. So how do you assess risk? Well, from an asset class or an investment category standpoint, if you're looking at the screen, this is um, what's called what is your risk tolerance? Every one of these, different colored boxes represents an investment class. There are different risks associated with each, okay? So stocks, um, which, and especially in the smaller cap arena, this is widely considered the riskiest class, has the highest possible return, but also has the lowest possible drop that it can sustain or risk to the downside. Whereas mutual funds, they are more diversified, typically risk is spread out a little bit more, they have a little less growth potential, a little less risk in terms of downside, okay? So gold, precious metals, kind of almost on par. Uh, real estate, depending on the market, this arrow may have been all the way down here, like 2007 through 10. Um, and then you have variable annuities, which we do not sell here at First Down. We do not believe in this category they have is almost as much risk as mutual funds, okay? And less upside potential. Cash, okay, again, no downside risk, um, depending on the solvency, I guess, of the financial <laughs> institution, but, you know, you have the FDIC backing them. Um, bonds, as we saw with some of the TSP numbers just in the last quarter, I should say just in the last year, for gosh sakes, wow. I mean, they've really had a big hit. And the more interest rates go up, the more the F-based fund or any fixed mutual fund or ETF that trades in a longer term bond-based category and duration um, will have higher risk, right? So CDs and cash, and obviously, you know, the rates in these areas, including fixed annuities, have been increasing. Remember, much of these areas were paying Heck, a year ago, quarter of a percent. Now they're paying some as much as four and a half to five and a quarter. Sounds like a huge change, right? You're like, all of a sudden, well, I'm gone from earning a quarter to earning five and a quarter. Yes, that's true. But inflation's also gone way up. 
So I always, um, you know, will encourage everybody to look at it from the standpoint of a cost of capital, um, not only in relation to purchasing power. Okay. And I see the AMT question coming out. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that a little bit later. Um, and actually, the way we're sort of headed in this discussion of risk, it avoids alternative minimum tax, by the way. Um, so with a fixed annuity, it's similar to a CD in that it is guaranteed by an insurance company, and the uh, rates are typically a little bit higher. Um, the beauty of the annuity concept is that very simply, uh, it is tax deferred growth, and there's no risk, zero. So you know, arguably there's no risk in cash sitting in a money market, obviously, or CDs, but there's no risk with any kind of annuity. There's absolutely zero. Um, and this is an asset class that, before I forget, let me just show you this. I thought this was a great piece I saw. Um, this, there's probably a bunch out here you can Google on this category, but um, have been individual annuity sales have absolutely shattered records in the last year. I mean, last year was a monster year. I mean, it's been a, just an absolute sea change into this asset class. And our book past the quadrant starts to, when we get past the explanation of each quadrant, we start to delve into all of the Nobel Prizes that have been awarded in financial theory that have brought annuities in as an asset class. And I'm going to give you some examples of that. But I think it's important to understand why um, it is and can be a piece of the pie of your portfolio for all the benefits that it does provide. But the industry as a whole has just seen just absolutely some man, just monster numbers pouring in. Now, in all fairness to some of these numbers, and I can quote this uh, website if you guys want, but in all fairness to that, it is both categories right here that are having these huge flows. Why? Well, because there's no downside risk. Concept of an annuity has always been beautiful. It's not appropriate for 100% of a client's assets, obviously, but it certainly can play a pivotal role for a portion of the portfolio. And whether it's a fixed or fixed indexed, index means that this can grow along with the market to the upside. Concept's always been a beautiful one. The implementation up until, in my opinion, the last five years has been pretty poor. So now there are products that are way, way better coming out to have no fees and significant upside potential, depending on the underlying index of the market does. So whether it's the S&P or NASDAQ, you all have that potential in this area. And I'll go into this more in the, the next example, but actually, let me just shift over so I can show this to you guys here. This kind of runs in tandem with this discussion because in risk, you know, the key really is, is for all clients to understand that in any decline, right, which is here on the left on our sort of um, X axis, the decline in a portfolio and the corresponding growth that is needed to get it back to flat. So over the course of the last 20 years, and I've done tons of blogs on this and a whole bunch of podcasts, but it's very easily illustrated in that if you were an investor, let's say in 2000, and let's, you know, maybe you had a good chunk inside of equities or stock based funds or then stocks general, you had, you know, obviously a big decline. Tech got crushed in the bottom of the market in 03. Um, and then it literally took almost 13 years to get back to zero inside your accounts, right? Because the industry, at least the stock bond and a fund industry, which predominates most of financial media, will say things like, well, you know, you're diversified and, you know, it'll always come back. Well, <laughs> the problem is, is most of First Down's clients, especially a ton of our federal clients, they don't have 13 years to get that back, right? So it's much more important that the key thing to portfolio management now, at least in our view, is don't take big losses in the accounts, right? And then you live to, to, to invest another day, so to speak. But if you lose 40% of your money, as you can see the trajectory here, you have to have a 66% return to get back to just flat. So one bad year in the market can result in significant setback in achieving financial goals. I think most people understand that. What I don't think is they understand the magnitude of how hard it has to go back up, so to speak, 
to recover from market loss can be substantially greater than the percentage itself, right? So if you get down 50%, you know, you, you take an account from 500 in my next example and it drops to 250, right? You're off 50%. The account has to double just to get back to flat. So culminate that with the 13 years it took for the 09 correction to get back up, right? Or any of the corrections that took place in 03 or the early parts of the 90s. So we've been through, Steve and I, now three full market cycles. And we've seen everything that works in this industry. And myself as the portfolio manager for First Down, uh, really the bottom line is, and again, this is in my January 2002 podcast, we moved almost all of our clients out of the market um, to a large degree, maybe with a 10 or 15% exposure at this point in January of 22, um, with the exception of clients that had you know, obviously big capital gains on some of their non-qualified accounts and essentially all the stuff outside of retirement. Um, but we really just, we were not exposed to the market. You know, we didn't suffer the huge hits last year. Now, consequently, if, <laughs> if the markets drop another 25%, which we fully believe is going to happen this year, we don't have a problem sifting through the ashes or sifting through the embers of the fire trying to find good stuff, right? Uh, or reallocating accounts to take advantage of that. But the way we're positioning accounts with clients right now in our next example on the screen um, is basically a comparison. I like to call it a tale of two retirement accounts, right? So, and not that everybody in this example would be risky just because it's a TSP, but if you had 100% in any of the stock-based funds in the TSP, would be, we'd consider that a risky account right now. So if the account went down 25%, basically leaves about 350 grand in the account versus if you look at something like a risk-free account, this just stands for fixed indexed annuity, by the way, right here, we wouldn't put all 500 in there, but this is just a, an apples to apples comparison, but the account going up, right? And you're saying, well, you know, how can it go up 15% this year? Well, the fixed accounts are paying 5% inside the FIA and you get a 10% bonus to start the account. So at the end of the year, if our prognostications come true, you know, obviously past performance is no indication of the future. As I often joke on my blog and my podcast, I, can, I could be wrong, right? Um, <laughs> Learn that from my old boss, Ken Fisher, by the way. But the, you know, it's true, you know, and you always want to think, hey, if I'm wrong, you know, how do I sort of sustain uh, a less risk based upon being incorrect? And then the key thing right now is just be less risky. So in this particular case, there's almost a quarter of a million dollar difference between the two accounts in how you can look at getting structured in this type of sitch. And then the benefits in addition to this is just a free lifetime income rider and a free nursing home doubler. So we, we've had, you know, just an absolute mountain of interest in kind of how we present this. And I think that, um, you know, just taking a look at the, I'll just go back to page one instead. This book's a probably a bit bigger than it is to see how it plays out. But if we go through in the table of contracts, if somebody wants to do a deeper dive in this area, you know, we go through what is the history, you know, how does research and asset allocation play a part in how the account gets set up, right? And I didn't want to take more than about a half an hour today to go through all this, kind of want to open up for some Q&A. Um, and by the way, this is being recorded. We'll upload it and we'll put it in the workflows for some of you are just joining us late. So you'll get an automatic recording of this. It'll be up on our YouTube channel. Um, so no, uh, let your hearts not be troubled there. But the real key to any of this stuff is just reducing risk. That's kind of where it is. So Q&A window is open. Um, and by the way, if you guys have any questions, let me just go to the last page. You can give me a call. I'm actually in the office for the next couple hours today. Uh, you can also send me an email if you wish. Um, I have another presentation that I'm almost finished with. This is the other PowerPoint here. Um, and what this one does is really do a pretty deep dive and it's interlaced with some of the Federal Reserve's 
FERS program, which Steve and I are both experts on. We actually have all of the FERS information. It's probably close to 150 files. If you guys ever have any questions on any individual components of FERS, um, as we have communicated to a lot of the directors uh, at both agencies, um, you know, we're really willing to sort of step in and help you guys understand all this. But as a recap, the key is, is reducing risk while markets are volatile or potentially going down. Sure, make sure you're diversified. We can help you with that. Um, but at the same time, also making sure that you have maximized contributions to these accounts. If individuals in the financial field are trying to make it that much more complex than what I've just laid out, they're trying to confuse you and you should run. So with that, any questions on anything? You guys are peeing too good to me here. You should start dragging me over the coals here. So the question asked just now was about what's called, what I like to call the life target funds, right? They're called something different, but let me just jump back to the website. The, the key thing with, TSP site, right? So let's go there. The key thing with these funds is understanding what they are, okay? Um, Actually, let me just unselect all and just go with the L240. These codes, by the way, of the year you're going to retire, as many of you may know. Um, but the anything that is, here's the best way to look at this too. Anything that from a, like a 2025, you know, which is just a couple of years away, is going to be a lot less aggressive, right? Than something that's a 2065 or higher, right? I actually haven't seen too much components of the 65 fund, but the problem with being in any of these right now, and that's just, you know, it's strictly risk is if interest rates are going up and we're a full employment market, we're going to have to see stress in the employment side of the market for the Fed to stop raising rates, you know? And right now, <laughs> if you take a look at, and I'm not going to bore you guys with charts, but I do this a lot on my, this is just a chart of the S&P. Each candle represents a single day. You don't need to be confused or any of this different stuff. It's just part of the analysis I do for clients and trading. Um, but the real key thing is, is that if the, it's probably easier to look at this on a weekly chart. If the Fed starts increasing even half of what we see potentially going up, which is more than likely going to be pretty catastrophic to the marketplace. This is just a longer term chart in the market. This is where the S&P is going, guys. And this is a lot lower than where we are, okay? And remember, this was March of 2020. So it just goes to show you how far, how fast this market has come in terms of being pumped up with liquidity, right? This could be an absolute deflating ball. And the problem with this is if the Fed was to raise, make up a number, another 200 basis points, which is 2%, all the bonds in current portfolios, even those short-term portfolios, they're going to get clobbered. And that's the concern we have. So, you know, you guys know our stance. We're mostly in cash with clients or we're in fixed indexed annuities, which are offering a much, much greater bonus at this point um, and a good return over the next year um, and longer. Um, and, you know, we'd like to see, you know, obviously the Fed not increase interest rates and the market gain some solid footing lower, right? So that we can allocate back into these areas. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, just know that, it, you know, so I tell you, this is a great question that was just asked. And it said, is it a good time to put money in a TSP? Here's the key. You guys can always allocate the money that's in the TSP to the cash fund. And again, let me jump back over here. I got like nine screens going on. But you guys can always put the money into, oops, there we go. See the G fund right here? I get too much stuff clicked on. Let me unclick all this. There we go. And just the G fund. So there's the G fund. So you're not going to get rich off this. Obviously, you're not going to beat inflation. But as you can look over the history of the fund, it's basically sitting cash. Okay. Cool thing about this is the government kind of juices some of the yields in this for you guys. Um, so you can see the when interest rates are really low, this fund did pretty well. And then when the market bombs out, 
and certainly if you're paying attention to what I'm talking about or talking to us directly, um, you'll know <laughs> when we're going to start sifting through the ashes of a much lower market. Um, but for now, you never want to not contribute. That's the key. Just put it in something that's more secure. Yes, you're not going to get wealthy off of that. Um, but as you'll hear throughout the last 10 years, I've been broadcasting on this. Cash is a position, right? Well, I'm not making any money. Cash is a position, though. It is. It's called protecting wealth during a downside in the market. Something that many, many people we really wish at first down that they had learned much earlier on because we wouldn't have had anywhere near the clobbering of the stuff we saw in 2008 through 10. I can't tell you how many cases that Steve and I saw, countless meetings with clients back then that had everything in the stock market in funds or 401ks or whatever. And even if they had 70 or 80% stock funds and arrested in a, in a G-based type fund, still got killed. And, so, and many of them had to retire. I mean, there are stories, so many stories of somebody having a million bucks or 500 grand get cut in half and they were already retired. There's no risk management strategy. And the problem with that is that you must draw income in most of these clients' cases they had to supplement other income. Many of them had to go back to work. And if it was uh, you know, a federal government employee or somebody in a, in a large corporation, you know, they had to go back to work um, to, you know, try to earn some more money. I mean, this was just really a problem. So, you know, we have ways to help solve this. We can certainly help you with allocations and make sure I jump back to the slide because a couple of people are asking me for this wrong slide. Mm -hmm. Like too, I get too many screens going. I have like five screens in my office. So sorry, I keep jumping around here, but make sure I'm sharing the right screen. So there we go. Um, but yeah, you guys can always send me an email, you know, questions, stuff like that, concerns. Um, by the way, thank you to Samantha um, at Ezra. Um, she's really been great at, at helping us get this organized. So our hats off to her um, in helping uh, us uh, guys get through putting together, hopefully, a, a powerful presentation. So we've got a couple other questions here. Um, yeah, so the life strategies, hopefully I've straightened that out. Um, yes, I will be in the office later today if you want to call. So alternative minimum tax was a question that was asked a couple of times. Um, and AMT, <laughs> the problem with trying to give a simple answer to that is that it is almost 100% specific to each individual or a couple's case. Um, there is no, I mean, certainly there's, there, you can Google it, um, but oftentimes the alternative minimum tax is levied to somebody that has a huge municipal bond portfolio, right? And I'm talking somebody that earns in excess of just a ridiculous amount of money um, in triple tax free, which inside of a lot of the products we help structure clients in, either in the life or annuity arena, um, you won't, you're not subject to alternative minimum tax with that. But um, that is a question that if an individual or a couple has been taxed AMT wise, um, our recommendation, depending on your cost basis in these investments, is to rearrange the portfolio to avoid that. Um, the other question is so, how can an FI be beneficial or even available if retiring within five years? Um, the, the, the key thing to that is that, you know, again, first and foremost, max out these accounts if you can. Um, I'm, I'm always a little more like direct and to the point, not candy coated because, um, I've had many clients come to us and their budgets are just ridiculous. Um, and obviously they don't want to hear from me you need to, you know, pare down the budget or you're not going to have any investment accounts by the time you retire. Um, but that's sort of that whole hard truth. <laughs> that you guys will always get from us. Um, but outside of maxing out retirement accounts, um, we can help invest in these areas with outside accounts. So if you have a spouse or family members or an inheritance or stuff like that, you know, there's many of these things we can address with you um, and go through it. We have all kinds of cool tools like asset maps uh, that will help structure financial planning software. And this is all very, very easy to understand stuff. There is inordinate about, and I'll leave you guys with this as well, 
this is sort of that simplicity factor that we're constantly working with clients on. There is an inordinate amount of financial software out there that's just super confusing. And what I tell clients is set up an account on Mint, M-I-N-T, right? Mint is the retail side of QuickBooks. So it's Intuit's retail. They have an excellent budgeting. Um, and, you know, it's just like, it's almost like TurboTax for yourself, for a personal. You can attach all your accounts so it'll track everything. It's actually really cool. I do it myself. Most of my clients that are really interested in budgeting will use Mint, M-I-N-T, um, to set all their stuff up. But the key is, is attach all your stuff to it. So most clients will attach bank accounts. It's super secure. Uh, this is probably one of the more secure companies on this planet. Um, the They'll attach credit cards, loans, everything. And it amortizes mortgages. It goes through everything for you. But the other cool thing about this is it recognizes transactions, right? In the old days, the software stunk because you had to update every transaction. Nobody did it, right? Including me. And I'm absolutely bananas about budgeting. <laughs> it just asks my wife. Um, but the key is, is this automatically uses AI to label your transaction. So if you go out to um, lunch at Panera, it recognizes that it's meals, right? Or entertainment or some category you assign to that and you can have it as. So I, I, I always say that it's, it's almost like an automatic budgeting system on steroids. But each month, you know, many people are really surprised that, wow, I spent that much on that. I spent that much on this. Um, I, I can totally cut this down, right? You know, and the beauty of a lot of federal employees, some of you guys, fantastic jobs. Um, so even though you have a higher level of income, um, you know, you still should look at a budget. I mean, there's people out there that we have as doctors. Uh, many of our, uh, about 120 of our clients are doctors and many of them are highly compensated, but we try to get everybody on understanding where all their money's going, right? Even though it's a larger budget, you still want to have an idea where your money's going because then it just allows you to possibly segment out other pieces of income to invest. And that's the key. Anyway, I've been droning on here. So you guys are asking some really good questions. So if you want, you can always send me more, call me, all that fun stuff. But I want to thank everybody for their time. This is recorded and we've had a lot of people show up today. So I appreciate you guys' opportunity. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to give me a call. But have a safe, profitable, and risk-free week. Thank you.